I've got chunks of ribeye steak, and I tried to cut off the big pieces of fat and gristle, but of course, the fat in a ribeye is part of where the flavor comes from. And I'm tossing the beef in melted butter and just good old grill seasoning, whatever your favorite seasoning is for steak, basically. And the secret is to use a pretty good cut of beef. So these are ribeyes. All right, I have a very, very hot cast iron skillet. And look out, <laughs> this is gonna make a lot of noise. And the secret here is you wanna push the steak all into a single layer. So you want a pretty big skillet if you can get it. That way you can get them all cooked in one batch. All right, so I'm gonna leave the steak alone for the first minute and let it really sear. And then I'll kind of start flipping it and stirring it. Probably cook the beef for about three to four minutes until it's medium rare. Oh my gosh. Hello, look at that. It smells amazing. Now, just before these were done, I actually turned the heat down under the skillet. So it's more on a medium low. So I'm gonna add some more butter to the mix. And look at how just dirty the skillet is. And by dirty, I mean coated in like beef flavor and seasoning, that brown butter. And then I'm adding more butter on top of that. And I've got some minced rosemary. It kind of adds a little bit of elegance to whatever you're making. And I agree. it really goes with beef. There's something about rosemary and beef that just knocks my socks off. Okay, now I'm just stirring to kind of start cooking the garlic. I don't want it to burn. And that's part of why I turned the skillet down. Turn it up just a little bit. And now, I'm gonna go in with some heavy cream. This is a creamy blue cheese sauce. Wow. I mean, wow. There are no other words <laughs> than wow. And then a couple of big spoonfuls of prepared horseradish, which is very beef friendly, especially around the holidays. I love roast beef and horseradish sauce. Delicious. Blue cheese. I think blue cheese is definitely one of those controversial ingredients, but when you add it to a creamy sauce like this, it just kind of makes it a little bit more mild. You get all of that yummy kind of interest of the blue cheese, and it's not overpowering like blue cheese can sometimes be. Ho, 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 oh ho, gosh. ho, ho. It looks incredible. And then I have some chives. I'm gonna save back a few. And honestly, that is basically it. A little bit of black pepper, or a lot of black pepper. <laughs> the rosemary smells amazing. Heaven. That is sheer heaven. So, to serve, I'm gonna add the beef to a little serving dish. Okay, and then after you add the beef. You see all this stuff in the bowl? Mm. You have got to drizzle that over. That cannot go to waste. Wow. Okay, I'm actually gonna try, I was gonna spoon this, but I think I'm gonna try to pour oh, it. No. <laughs> what? I'm nervous. I can do it. I can do this. I'm a trained professional. It just goes in the center well. Wow. And look at that. Absolute heaven in a serving vessel. <laughs> Chives can go over the meat, they can go right in the center of the sauce, but I'm gonna cheat and grab a little bite. Should I? Oh my gosh. Merry Christmas. I've got a pan of butter and oil going. And I'm gonna cook the steaks first. Actually, I put in the pasta first, but next thing I'm gonna do is cook steaks. Come on. I've got two strips, and I'm gonna get these steaks into this smoking, smoking hot pan. These are pretty thick strip steaks. Kansas City strip, New York strip. You can also do ribeyes. I kinda of like strips for things like this because ultimately I'm gonna slice this and serve it over the pasta. And there's usually just a little bit less fat with strips than with ribeyes. 
Everybody excited to be here today? So, so excited. excited. So like excited. We never left. It's great to see your smiling faces. Okay, so I just have to babysit these steaks. I'm going to cook them for about two to three minutes per side until they're beautifully medium rare. All right, Alex, do you want to come look at these beautiful steaks? Look, you can kind of see the side. Oh, baby. That it's just that beautiful medium rare. So I'm going to take them off and put them on a cutting board and let them rest. I love letting steaks rest. And this is so interesting. Your dad does not like letting steaks rest. Mm. Well, partially because he wants to eat the steak as soon as it comes out of the skillet. But I've tried and I've tried for years to tell that man you got to let them rest because then the juices all distribute and the meat just looks perfectly cooked when you do. So it's something that Lad and I have not been able to resolve in 25 years. Um, I'll keep you posted on how that's coming. <laughs> okay, so right in the same skillet as the steaks, I just added sliced onions and garlic. You want to look in here, Alex? And it's very important not to clean that skillet because you've got all that beautiful butter and oil in there. Okay, so they're starting to soften because the pan was very, very hot. So I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons of tomato paste. Tomato, tomato paste. paste. And I'm gonna stir the tomato paste into the onions and let it kind of hit the bottom of that pan and start to fry. And then this is a good time to add some crushed red pepper flakes to taste, just depending on how hot you like things to get. Okay, so the tomato paste is totally coating these beautiful onions. You guys ready? We're ready. Oh, yeah. If you were bored before, you're not going to be now. Woo! So look at this, Alex. This beautiful cast iron pan got so hot that it is already reducing the wine, which is exactly what you want to see. And so I'm going to turn the heat down and add the cream. So this is a creamy, luscious, wonderful, flavorful pasta. I've got some kale that I sliced and some collard greens. And basically, I just rolled the greens into like a big roll and sliced thin. And then I just have baby spinach leaves. So wonderful. So then you want to just kind of use the tongs to move the greens around. And I love adding greens to hot sauces because they just disappear almost instantly. And now it's time to get the pasta. So drain the water. And you can use any kind of pasta you want. I'm using fettuccine just because it's kind of big and hearty and it holds up to all those greens and the steak. But really, you could do rigatoni if you like short pasta, which my husband does. <laughs> <laughs> Lad is so complicated. <laughs> so then I'm going to grab a ladle full of the pasta water. <laughs> and this is just going to help turn the sauce a little more saucy. And then I have some grated fontina cheese. I mean, how much better could this possibly get? Ah, oh, this looks so good. And what I love about this is it's not like a heavy, creamy pasta. It really wasn't that much cream, but Alex, come in here and look at this. You've got to see the glory. Oh my gosh, that looks so good. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna slice the steak and let's check the doneness. How does it look? That's how we like it around here. Oh baby. Yum, oh. Yum, so, slice the steak and put the slices right on top. And it doesn't have to be like in one big neat piece. And then you can do a balsamic glaze if you want. But I got some good old fashioned steak sauce. Okay. So you just kind of do a little, a little rustic drizzle. <laughs> Otherwise known as kind of a messy drizzle. And then I have some parsley, curly parsley. It's <laughs> just to embrace the kind of steakhouse nature. But look. Oh, it's beautiful. It looks so good. Steak and creamed greens pasta. There are a lot of arguments for five ingredient cooking. 
less shopping, less prep, less fuss. And when you think about how quick and easy the recipes are, I am completely sold. So let's take these five ingredients here and turn them into my current favorite sheet pan supper in the Western Hemisphere. I'm gonna make a steak sheet pan supper. I'm starting by cutting some big, thick rings of bell pepper, and I want the rings to be really thick so they can stand up against the big, juicy steaks. You don't wanna do really thin rings because by the time the sheet pan supper is finished, they'll be a little bit soggy, and you want them to still have a little bit of crispness. All right, I'm gonna put these onto the sheet pan. And the cool thing is these are gonna kind of serve as a bed for the steak. So I'll get them on there, along with some big, thick slices of onion. Steak and onions to me are just a glorious combination. Okay, I think that's good. Now I've also got some cherry tomatoes and I'm gonna scatter them just throughout the peppers and onions. All right, so the bed of veggies is all ready. So now I'm gonna add some steaks, and you guessed it, they're going right on top. I'm using boneless ribeyes, and then I'm gonna season the steaks with just a little bit of Montreal seasoning, which is just a prepared seasoning. It always has a really nice steakhouse flavor. It's got a great texture. And I like to sprinkle the seasoning on first, and then I'll drizzle on a little bit of olive oil. All right, now after the olive oil, I'm just gonna put a nice generous pat of butter on each steak. Now the sheet pan's gonna go into the oven. The broiler is nice and hot. So I'm gonna broil it on the first side until it's totally browned. Okay, it's been about five minutes and my kitchen smells like a steakhouse already. Let's check out the first side of the steaks. Ooh, look at that sizzling steak. Oh, the butter really helps it brown a little bit quicker. So I'll turn the steaks over to the other side. You can see that they need some browning too. And I'm gonna season the second side exactly the same way. Montreal seasoning and then olive oil and butter. So simple. Now when you make this sheet pan supper, you wanna start with steaks that are on the thick side. If you have thin steaks, by the time the outside of the steak is brown, they'll be too overcooked. All right, second round of butter goes on. So the second side doesn't take as long. I'm gonna keep my eye on it. And I'll probably brown it for another three minutes. You are not gonna believe how good this looks. Oh my, look at those steaks, guys. Oh, so sizzly and perfect. The veggies are just the way I want them. All right, it's time to serve these up. You know, depending on the appetites in your house, you can call this a four-person meal, or if you're like Lad and me and you love big, thick, juicy ribeyes, it's a dinner for two. The last thing to add to the plates, some crusty bread. The harder it is to tear, the better. I'll just add a big chunk to each plate. And I like to put the pan close by on the dinner table and that way you can tear off little pieces of the bread and dip it in all these juices. Amazing Salisbury steak. So I'm making the meat mixture for the Salisbury steak now. So all it is is ground beef, seasoned breadcrumbs. I'm adding some dry mustard and a good old ingredient from the 70s, French onion soup mix, and I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of it to the meat mixture. And then a spoonful of ketchup, just to keep it down on the, the sphere of earth, salt and pepper, and Worcestershire sauce. Nothing kind of new or earth shattering about this combination. It's just good old Salisbury steak, like the kind you had at your grandmother's house. They call it steak, but they're actually burgers, okay? And they're formed to look like little steaks. And then you make sort of a brown gravy to go over the top. Okay, so this is enough meat for four Salisbury steaks. So I'm just gonna kind of divide it in, in four pieces visually so I don't get too big of a piece for each one. 
And this is the funny part. So to form Salisbury steak, you form a burger patty, but in kind of an oval shape. So it looks like a steak, okay? Then you take the side of your hand and make like little ridges down each one. And that way when it cooks, it kind of cooks like a steak. <laughs> like grill marks. That's what grandma used to do. <laughs> okay, so that's one Salisbury steak, and I'm gonna do the same thing with three more. Okay, so I got the four Salisbury steaks formed, and I've got a skillet with a little bit of olive oil and butter, and I'm just gonna set them in. I'm gonna put them with kind of the ridges down and cook that side first. One, two, three, four. My grandma would be so proud of me. Okay, so I'm gonna let them start cooking on the first side, and I'm gonna wash my hands, and then I'll finish cooking them and take them out of the pan. Oh, look at those juicy steaks. <laughs> Okay, so now normally I would pour off excess grease, but the beef was pretty lean, so I'm not gonna worry too much about it. There's not too much in the pan, but there's just enough to start on the delicious gravy that goes with the Salisbury steak. So I'm sprinkling a little bit of flour into the skillet, and I'm just gonna let it cook for a little bit, just 30 seconds or so. Just turn it into a paste and whisk it into that all of those drippings on the bottom of the pan, scraping up all that good stuff. All right, and now for the fun part. I'm gonna turn off the heat because I've learned my lesson. And I'm gonna add about quarter cup to half a cup of sherry, which is the update for this Salisbury steak. Now, when my grandma made Salisbury steak, she never used any sort of alcohol. It was definitely kind of a family-friendly, middle America dish. So now that the alcohol has evaporated, I turn the heat back on. And can you smell that, Alex? Yeah, it smells so good. It really smells amazing. And it's already starting to thicken, which is great. So I'm gonna pour in some beef broth. And I'm gonna keep whisking while I pour it in, just so it keeps getting hot and keeps mixing in. I wanna make sure I get all of that good stuff scraped off the bottom of the pan. All righty. And then the sauce needs a little ketchup too. I don't want the sauce to feel left out. Alex is not a ketchup fan, so this is a stretch for her right now. Yeah. All right. And then this good old French onion soup packet, I'm gonna add the rest of it. So I'm gonna let this heat up and bubble and thicken. So give me just a couple minutes for that. Okay, Alex, look at this brown gravy. It's not like thick, thick, thick gravy, but it'll thicken up more as it sits. So I'm gonna turn the heat way down and back to our Salisbury steaks. I'm gonna put it right back into the gravy and then this is the key with Salisbury steak. You've got to spoon that brown gravy all over the steaks. And ideally, you add the steaks back into the gravy and let them kind of simmer for about 10 minutes and keep spooning the gravy over the steaks. Really amazing. So I'm gonna sprinkle on some parsley. I don't remember my grandma ever sprinkling fresh parsley over hers, but she probably wanted to. <laughs> All right, retro Salisbury steaks, the way my grandma used to make them. So this dish calls for small little steak medallions and I'm using beef filet. Hello. And I have a cast iron skillet that's really hot with a little bit of butter and olive oil and I'm gonna put them seasoned side down. I seasoned the steak medallions with Montreal steak seasoning, which is so delicious. Oh, it's just got all the good things that you want for red meat. 
Okay, now I'll sprinkle the seasoning on the other side. And the good thing about beef fillets is even if you undercook them a little bit, they're still delicious. You definitely don't want to overcook them. Okay, so I've got the skillet on medium-high heat. It's going to get a little smoky in here, but I'm going to cook these steaks until they're medium-rare. It's going to take about two to three minutes per side. All right, the steaks look amazing, so I'm gonna get them out of the skillet, and I'm gonna turn the heat to about medium, and Alex, look at this skillet. Oh my God. I mean, the flavor in this pan. It's butter, it's oil, it's a little bit of the steak flavor. It's the Montreal steak seasoning. Amazing. So I'm gonna let the steaks rest, and I'm gonna add a whole bunch of onions to the skillet, of course, without cleaning it at all, because you want the onions to get kind of dirty with all that yummy steak flavor and seasoning. And then I have garlic and thyme and oregano, just a little bit of both. And those go in. So now I'm gonna stir the onions around and let them cook until they're really golden and soft. It's gonna take about 6.2 minutes. All right, Alex, look at this. Look wow. at these onions. Oh my word. I love caramelized onions. It's one of my favorite things in the world. White wine, and I'm adding, oh, all of it. <laughs> At a certain point when you feel like there's only that much left in the bottle, you might as well just add the rest. Okay, and then this skillet is so hot that it's basically gonna evaporate pretty quickly and reduce, and it's gonna be this just super flavorful onion sauce. Okay, so I'm gonna let that reduce and I'm gonna go drain these potatoes, but I'm gonna show them to you first, Alex. Okay. They're little baby potatoes. Oh, they're so cute. I know, and I've just been simmering them in water. They're nice and tender, so I'm gonna go drain them. This will take me 10 seconds tops. All right, so I've got the potatoes, and I'm just gonna put them straight on the serving platter where I'm gonna serve everything else. Hopefully I don't have any runaways. And then, this is so cool. <laughs> Did I lose one? Oops. Okay, so I have this little dish, and I'm gonna use it to smash the potatoes. So come look, and I'll do just a few at a time. Ready? <laughs> look, it just kind of breaks them open and makes them just a little bit more inviting. And then I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do to these, and it'll all make sense. Okay, I'm gonna sprinkle the potatoes with a little bit of sea salt. And then I almost forgot, I have a little dish of horseradish sauce, and I'm gonna make a little space <laughs> right in the center. Ooh, I love anything that has a dish of sauce right in the middle of it. It just means it's gonna be extra delicious. Okay, so the onions are looking amazing and I have some softened butter, believe it or not. And I'm just gonna kind of swirl it into these onions and it just kind of helps that sauce become a little bit more rich and creamy. Oh my. Okay, so the onions are looking great. So I'm gonna basically put these all over the potatoes. Oh my word, delicious. That looks delicious. And as you can imagine, so the steaks, Alex, what do you think so far? Mm, they're beautiful. And just nestle them in on top of the potatoes. You can kind of push them in here and there. Oh, how special is this? It could be for Father's Day, a birthday, I mean, you can make it for your mom, too. <laughs> Moms like food like this. And then this is the key. All of this flavor from the steaks as they've been resting, you don't want to wash this down the drain. That would be a travesty. And then there are a few extra onions, so I'll just kind of put a few over the steaks, grab some parsley leaves, and just sprinkle them over. Makes it pretty, gives it a little freshness. All right, steak medallions with potatoes. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Yeehaw! <laughs> steak salad sandwich board. That way everybody can eat their steak however they want. This is great for family dinner or if you're having company over. The first step is to season a bunch of sliced onions and two good looking ribeye steaks and all I'm using is 
lemon pepper seasoning. And those look great. And then I'm gonna sprinkle on some salt too. And I've got a grill that is really heating up here. So I'm gonna brush on some olive oil first just to make sure the steak doesn't stick. And I'll put the seasoned side down and that way I can season the other side. Okay, now I've just got to grill the steaks, then I'll take them off the grill pan, grill the onions, then I'll make some horseradish mayo, get bread ready, slice the steaks, and I will see you on the other side. So for the steak, I'll give them five minutes on the first side, turn them, and cook them for four more minutes until they're medium rare. Then I'll take them out onto a board and just let them rest. Next, I'll put the onion rounds on and cook them for about five minutes. Now for the horseradish mayo. So for this, I'll add half a cup of mayo to a bowl, along with half a cup of sour cream, three tablespoons of prepared horseradish, a teaspoon of Worcestershire, half a teaspoon of black pepper, a good pinch of salt, give everything a good mix, and tip it into a serving bowl. Okay, back to the onions. I'll just turn them and give them a few more minutes. Then it's all about the crusty bread. Put it on a board and cut slices. The onions are ready, so I'll take them off. And finally, it's about slicing the steak. And with that, everything's good to go. Okay, I do believe I have everything I need to build this steak salad sandwich board. So I'm gonna start with the steaks and I'm gonna arrange everything on this beautiful board. With the steak, I'm gonna put some slices of bread. Now, these beautiful onions. The lettuce, beautiful tomato slices. And then I have sliced white cheddar, this beautiful horseradish mayo, sliced green onions to put on the steak. A little bit of sea salt over the tomatoes. It is absolutely glorious. Steaks and french fries are way up there on the list of foods the Drummond family loves. But I'm gonna amp that up by making flank steak with herb sauce and three cheese waffle hash browns. How good does that sound? I'm starting with the flank steak. I'm just patting it dry. And I'm gonna add a very simple seasoning of just salt and pepper. Now I have a hot grill pan and I'm gonna put it season side down. And I'll let it start grilling while I season the other side. Flank steak has such amazing flavor. Love the texture. It's gonna take about five minutes on the first side. So I'm gonna get started on the mixture for the three cheese waffle hash browns. I have frozen shredded hash browns that I let thaw and I'm adding some melted butter. I'm gonna add three grated cheeses. I've got cheddar, mozzarella, and pepper jack. Okay, now I wanna season this with some salt and lots of pepper. When my family eats any kind of fried potato, they add tons of pepper. Okay, and I'm gonna get this into the waffle maker so it can start to cook. I've already got the waffle maker nice and hot. And it's really important to spray it well with cooking spray, just so those potatoes don't stick. And I'm gonna spray the top two. And then I'm gonna add a heaping cup to each of the wells of the waffle maker. This is a great approach to take if you're making a brunch for a family that's visiting for the holidays. They're perfect with a salad for lunch. <laughs> now that's my kind of eating. Make a healthy salad and then eat cheesy hash brown waffles with them. <laughs> and then I'll close the waffle maker and it's gonna take this about 12 minutes to cook. So I'm gonna go back to the flank steak, see if it's ready to turn over. Ooh, look at how good this is looking. Beautiful surface, gorgeous grill marks. Now I need to let it cook on the second side for another five minutes. Okay, the steak is finished cooking. So I'm gonna get it off of the pan. While the steak rests, I'm gonna make a beautiful herb sauce to pour over the sliced steak. 
And I'm gonna pour some olive oil into a bowl, about two thirds of a cup, about a quarter cup of red wine vinegar, finely minced shallots. I've got some serrano pepper that's finely diced. And I'll grate in a clove of garlic. And then I'll chop up a mixture of basil, mint, parsley, and cilantro. This is basically a version of chimichurri, which is right up there with my favorite steak sauces. It's basically a mixture of green herbs, a little bit of oil and vinegar. It is so tasty. Okay, those herbs are totally minced. They smell so good. I would love to have a candle with the scent of all of these herbs together. Delicious. I am so scent driven. <laughs> yum, yum. Okay, I'm gonna add some salt and pepper to the sauce and then this will be good to go. All right, I'm gonna let this sit and I am going to slice the flank steak. We'll see how this looks. I do believe it turned out just perfect. Grab the platter and I'll get the steak on. Nothing like a white platter when you're serving glorious medium rare beef. Now, as if that wasn't exciting enough, it's time to check on these, oh, waffle hash browns. Oh, look at how golden and crisp these are. And I might add cheesy. Okay, I'm just gonna kind of overlap them one by one. They're nice and hot. Now for the herb sauce. This is so pretty. And I'm just gonna spoon it in a line on the beef. The garlic in this sauce adds really big flavor and the herbs are so fresh. And then I'll put the rest of it in a little dish on the side. Well, I am almost speechless. This is so pretty. Flank steak with herb sauce, three cheese waffle hash browns. This is a new favorite in our house. I'd say I've definitely raised the steaks. A lot of people say, you know, I love steak, but I don't want to eat steak and potatoes every night. I always direct them to the big steak salad. It's one of my favorite beef recipes. It's pretty much a huge salad with a big juicy steak on top. And then another thing on top, and I'll wait before I tell you about that. It's a pretty decadent dish. I've got two ribeye steaks, putting them in a plastic bag, and I'm gonna let them sit for just a short amount of time in this delicious marinade. It's an Asian-influenced marinade. The first ingredient is canola oil, red wine vinegar, and also balsamic vinegar, some Worcestershire sauce, soy sauce, and then for some zip, a couple of tablespoons of fresh lime juice, a little sugar for a hint of sweetness, garlic, some minced fresh ginger, hot chili oil, salt, and black pepper. Believe me, it's good. Now, I'll just pour half the marinade into the bag with the steaks. And the great news about this is it doubles as the salad dressing, so I'll save that for later. Now, I'll just seal up the bag. I'm gonna let the steaks marinate for about five to 10 minutes. You can let them go longer if you have the time, but you don't have to. Now, one of the best parts about this salad is I top the whole thing with thin fried onion rings. I've got two onions and I sliced them really, really thin. And I'm just gonna do a quick soak with some buttermilk. It's just gonna moisten them up, take a little bit of the pungent onion flavor away. And while they're sitting, I'll make the dry mixture. And that's just two cups of flour and a good amount of salt, just about a tablespoon or so. About a half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper gives them a little kick, and then just some regular pepper. And then I'll whisk this together. Okay, now I've got some oil going. It's about 350, 360. So I'm gonna stir the onion rings around just a little bit. And then I'll just take a little bunch, let the buttermilk drip off, drop them into the flour mixture, and then I'll pick them up and hit the tongs on the side of the pan. And that just helps the excess flour drop off. And then I'll just plunge them into the oil. And these are gonna fry in no time. I'm gonna do them in batches so they'll cook really evenly. And they are gonna be golden and crisp and out of this world. The onion rings are just about done. I'm just taking out the last of them. All right, I'll turn that off. 
Now I'll get the steaks going for the big steak salad. I've got a grill pan. That's a nice shortcut way to grill things. It gives things nice grill marks without having to go outside and light a big fire. All right. One steak, two steaks. Now I'll let those sit. They're gonna go about two to three minutes per side. So I'll get started on the salad ingredients. I've just got a big old box of mixed greens, arugula, radicchio. You can use any lettuce you want. All right, now I'll just throw in some whole grape tomatoes. I'm not even gonna cut them up. Okay, spread all that out. Now I'm gonna slice the steaks. I'll go against the grain and just slice sort of thin strips. I love warm steak and cold salad. It's one of life's real pleasures. Okay, and then of course, the grand finale. I'll just grab a nice handful of onion strings <laughs> and put them right on top of the salad. I know I am breaking a few rules here, but I don't care. This is so delicious. Lad and the kids have been up since 4 a.m. shipping cattle. It's long, dirty work, so as a treat, I'm rustling up a rib-sticking lunch of the kids' favorite dishes. For my little rancher Bryce, it's gotta be beef. So Salisbury steak in a tasty onion gravy seems like just the ticket. I just mixed together a pound and a half of ground beef, then added a half a cup of seasoned breadcrumbs to bind it all together. Then I added two teaspoons of dry mustard, a crumbled beef bouillon cube, four dashes of Worcestershire sauce, a tablespoon of ketchup, and some salt and pepper. After that, I kneaded the mixture together, formed some oval patties. I've got some oil and butter in a hot pan, and I'll just get the patties going. Now, because the patties begin with ground beef, I wanna make sure they're cooked all the way through. So I'm gonna cook them for about three to five minutes on the first side. Now, after the patties are fried, I'll take them out of the pan, and then I'll make a really yummy sauce and that's what makes Salisbury steak so yummy. The patties are done. I took them out of the pan and then I drained off all the grease, didn't clean the pan, and I threw in a sliced onion and I've been cooking that. It's nice and golden brown, so I'm gonna move into the sauce. I'll just pour two cups of beef broth right into the pan with the onions. You know, sometimes I call this gravy, but it's really not a gravy in the traditional sense of the word. It's more of a sauce. And the flavor of the patties really comes through. And then several dashes of Worcestershire sauce. Just eyeball it. And then for a little tang and sweetness, a tablespoon of ketchup. I'd say a heaping tablespoon. And then this is a strictly optional ingredient, but I like to add a little bit of seasoning and browning sauce into the pan. Ooh, <laughs> that's gonna be nice and dark. It really doesn't do too much, except it deepens the color, deepens the flavor a little bit. If you don't use it, it'll still be totally delicious. I'm gonna let that go a little bit. And to thicken it up a little, I'm going to mix some cornstarch with a little beef broth. just enough to turn it into a paste. My mother-in-law always makes fun of me because I stir things with the measuring spoons I use, but I don't like to do dishes, so I'm in the habit of dirtying as few things as possible. All right, now I'm just gonna add a couple of tablespoons of the cornstarch mixture to the sauce, and then I'll let it cook for just a minute and see what it looks like. The cornstarch thickens the sauce, but it also makes it nice and glossy and really beautiful. If it needs more thickening, I can always add more. If the sauce gets too thick, you can splash in a little beef broth. It's real easy, you can't mess it up. Okay, this looks perfect. It's getting nice and thick. So I'm just gonna add a little salt and pepper. And it looks just so good, so pretty. You can give it a taste, adjust the seasonings as you want, but it looks just right. So now I'll just stick the patties right back into the pan, nudge them around into the sauce, and then this sauce is so wonderful, I wanna spoon it over the tops of the patties. You know, the Salisbury steak, I remember, had really finely diced onions in the gravy, and if you didn't like onions, you were kind of out of luck but I like to slice them big, pick them off. 
All right, Salisbury steak is done. I'm just gonna let them simmer in the pan. The guys have been working so hard for the last two weeks, getting up at 5 a.m. every morning. And while we don't eat chicken fried steak every day, right now is the time that they really need something that sticks to their ribs. I seasoned this cube steak on both sides with salt and pepper. And then it goes into a seasoned flour mixture. I've got some cayenne, paprika, seasoned salt, a little salt and pepper. After the flour, it goes into an egg and milk mixture. The reason this is called chicken fried steak is it has a breading on it that resembles fried chicken. It's kind of confusing to people who aren't familiar with the dish. They want to know where the chicken is. Okay, once it's heavily breaded, you can set it aside. I've got some chicken fried steak already frying in a big skillet with oil and a little butter for color. And that's what brings the cowboys to the kitchen. This really is a great assembly line. If you just get it going, you can bread these while the other ones are cooking, take them out, and then it's ready to put the other ones on. These need to cook for about two to two and a half minutes per side until they're nice and golden. Okay, the steak's all done. The mashed potatoes are in the oven, and now I'm gonna make the gravy. You cannot have chicken fried steak without gravy. It's written in a law somewhere. So I started by draining off most of the oil from the pan where I cooked the meat. And I'm sprinkling in the seasoned flour that I used to bread the steak. It's really difficult to give a precise recipe for gravy because there's so much eyeballing going on. You just add a little grease, sprinkle on a little flour, stir it together. Basically, you wanna add enough flour into the pan that the mixture is more of a paste and doesn't have that greasy, oily appearance. So I'm gonna grab some milk, whole milk, please. You can't make gravy with skim milk, guys, I'm sorry. I'm gonna turn up the heat just a bit and then whisk the whole time while I pour the milk into the pan. It looks really weird when you first start pouring the milk in and you'll become filled with self-doubt. You'll worry if you've messed it up, but just stick with it. And as you're whisking, listen to this. That sound you hear are the little bits of flavor that were in the bottom of the pan after I cooked the meat. And that's what makes the gravy delicious. So you wanna scrape all of that up so it becomes part of the gravy. And at this point, it's just about babysitting the gravy. Never leave your wingman. If you can master the fine art of gravy with chicken fried steak, you can do most things in life. Even if the gravy has plenty of salt, you always need to add more black pepper. 